Hello, everybody. We are here at the International Maritime Museum of Hamburg. Well, not, not really. As you see, this is a black screen and a uh, green screen, sorry. And um, uh, because I'm in my home office, my name is Damien Moran. I work at the museum and I take care of the online communication there. And um, today we are going to be speaking about this ship you see in the background. Um, I'm pretty sure that any one of you already recognized it because it is uh, by any means the most famous ship in history. It is the RMS Titanic. And to speak about it, uh, I'm very, very honored to have today two very special guests. Um, real experts on the matter. Uh, I'm speaking about uh, Todd Nightring. Hi, Todd. Hello. Todd is a, a collector, a, a collector on um, memorabilia and especially photographs regarding uh, ocean liners in general, um, and has had a very long passion regarding the RMS Titanic, especially. And um, he also has an awesome Instagram account called The Ocean Colossus, where he shares uh, pictures from his collection regarding the history of ocean liners, that I, an account that I do recommend to follow. And um, uh, we also have with us our dear friend, Stephen Payne. Dr. Stephen Payne is naval, naval architect and um, I'm going to guess the only person alive right now that can claim to say he's built an ocean liner. Am I wrong? Stephen? Well, you're probably right. <laughs> you're probably right. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that, but anyway, um, uh, among other uh, incredible ships, um, Stephen has built the Queen Mary II, which is the, the, the last of her kind. It's the, the last passenger ships that can claim to be a real ocean liner, as was the Titanic. Um, so the, the, the Basics of the discussion. I'm going to um, the, this discussion. Actually, the, the idea came uh, to me uh, after I did a post last year on Titanic Day on on April the fifteenth. Uh, I wrote a short text um, uh, about why the Titanic is the most famous ship in the world. Like just quite a few a few basics, and there actually was a discussion online because. Uh, for many people, Titanic is the greatest, greatest ship ever built. Um, but some experts uh, and, and fans on the matter were um, kind of not that uh, fond of the fact that the Titanic is the most famous ship in the world. They, they were saying this, the ship doesn't deserve so much fame. Um, a little bit, uh, to put it in a provocative way, uh, it's a ship that didn't, didn't even complete it. Uh, her maiden voyage. So uh, my, 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 my question to you both, uh, uh, Todd and, and Stephen, is was the Titanic uh, an amazing ship or was the Titanic a bad ship? And what would you, what, what, how would you, you answer this in a, in a, um, in a short way? Um, would you like to- Stephen, you can go first. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, you, you've got to put Titanic in perspective because she was the second of three sister ships. And I, I think before we talk about Titanic, we have to put uh, her place in history mm -hmm. because it all started really with Cunard around 1903 when they were very worried about many of the steamship lines being bought up by an American combine, the International Mercantile um, Marine. And the British were worried about their governments losing control or the ability of taking ships and using them as troop ships and hospital ships in time of war if they were owned by this American company. So they were desperate to make sure Cunard didn't join this group because White Star had just been bought by the, by the group in 1903. And so the British government said to Cunard, 
if you design and build two large fast passenger ships, we'll give you a subsidy, not only to build the ships, but we'll give you a subsidy to operate them. And the two ships that were built in um, 1906 were the Lusitania and the Mauritania. And they immediately captured the Blue Ribbon for the fastest crossings across the North Atlantic, took a vast amount of the trade. And that left the other companies like North German Lloyd and White Star Line, Hamburg America. It left all those companies scrambling to really catch up and decide what they were going to do to compete with Cunard. And White Star took the opinion that they couldn't compete with Cunard on speed because the speed of the Lusitania and Mauritania at 25 knots required a thousand tons of coal per day hmm. to be shoveled into the boilers. And it was only because Cunard had that large subsidy that they could afford to operate those ships. And White Star Line would, wouldn't have the large subsidy. And so what they decided to do was build a much bigger ship than the Lusitania, the Mauritania. In fact, a ship that was 50% bigger. They would make the ship much more economical to run by operating it at a slower speed, around 22 knots. And they would build three of those ships to compete with Cunard. The big problem with the Lusitania and the Mauritania was that they vibrated very, very badly because the huge amount of power they needed to drive them at the speed made them very uncomfortable, especially at the aft end of the ship where the second class were. So White Star not only decided to build these super huge ships for the time, but they also wanted them to be the most comfortable and they hoped that way they would attract a lot of passengers and they would be able to compete with Cunard. So they started the design in 1908. Construction was ordered at Harlan and Wolf in Belfast. And the first of the ship was the Olympic. And she entered service in 1911. And she caused quite a sensation because she was 50% bigger than the Lusitania and the Mauritania, which before the Olympic were the largest passenger ships in the world. And certainly the Olympic was very, very popular. And she was to be followed the following year by her sister ship, the Titanic. And then a third ship was going to be ordered that was originally going to be called Gigantic. But um, she was eventually um, built and entered service around 1914 during the First World War as a hospital ship. And she was given the name Britannic rather than Gigantic. So Titanic was the second of the three ships. And although there's a lot of hype about Titanic, when she actually set off on her maiden voyage, there was very little press about it because she was just the second of the three ships. And of course, history unfolded as she left Southampton on April the 10th. 1912 around noon as soon as she backed out of the dock at Southampton other ships were pulled away from their moorings and there was almost a collision as she left the dock and of course had there been a collision it's likely that she wouldn't have gone across the Atlantic and, and wouldn't have struck the iceberg so that that was um, something that was um, a fate yeah. And then from Southampton, she went to Cherbourg. She stayed um, a few hours in Cherbourg, collected passengers, and then she went to Ireland. And then she started on a fateful voyage across the Atlantic. But what I would like to stress here throughout all the discussion we're going to have is that the Titanic complied with all the rules and regulations of the day. And in fact, she exceeded the rules and regulations with the number of places she had in lifeboats. In fact, she had almost double the number of lifeboat places that she was required to have. 
And the rules and regulations said that for a ship of Titanic size, she only needed four watertight bulkheads. In the event, she was designed and built with 15. So she far exceeded the rules and regulations of the day. And I think certainly from my perspective as a naval architect, as we go through the discussion here, we really should think that it was the rules and regulations that were at fault and not the ship. But I think we should ask Todd to say a few words about um, the opulence on the Titanic and how she compared perhaps with some of the other ships of the period. Please. Yeah, I think it was this perfect window at the time the ship sailed that, you know, the luxury was the highest at that point. But as most of us know, you know, she would be blown away the next year by the first of the Hamburg America ships and the, the French lines France, which uh, actually made her maiden voyage the same week that the Titanic did. And, uh, you know, the Olympics year was 1911 to 1912 and White Star had this momentum at that time. And then the Titanic was sort of catching that. And then it would have been eclipsed, you know, in short order and uh, been sort of like a middle child. You know, if you want to use that frame of reference, you know, the one that was better, but not very, the greatest and in and, and sort of, uh, you know, wonderful, beautiful inside, you know, the amenities were excellent and certainly a lot more uh, extensive than those on the Lusitania and the Mauritania. But then, you know, Cunard would catch up pretty quickly with the Aquitania, as we all know, you know, considered one of the most beautifully decorated of all Atlantic liners. Certainly, you know, up there, uh, it's, it's a matter of, uh, you could have an intense argument about, you know, if the Aquitania was better than the uh, Hamburg America ships, especially since they shared the same, you know, designers uh, for their first class. Uh, but, you know, the, that moment, the Titanic, it's almost like she was built for this, you know, thing, this like legendary event. And, uh, and afterwards, you know, it wouldn't have been the same. All right. So, uh, uh, so, so um, in, uh, from, from uh, thank you very much at first, but um, so I, I think what, what uh, the, the expression that Todd just, just used, uh, this, this middle child, uh, expression, uh, I think it's very interesting. Um, so from from you the so from 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 what you just said, um, what I what I would pick out is um, uh, uh, actually a, a a fine ship, um, a, 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 a safe ship for the for the um, uh, uh, the regulations as a compared to other ships of her time, uh, um, a safe ship, but. Um, but in no way, uh, the um, in no way, um, uh, um, just like this. So it, it was not in not even in her time. It she wasn't the the the, the greatest ship uh, on earth. And um, but it is nevertheless. And th this is actually also my, my experience uh, giving giving guided tours in the museum when when I when I walk past this. Uh, um, this model. This is always a point where all visitors, no matter who they are and where they come from, what's their background, um, where they all kind of like say, oh, I know that one. This is actually the, the one ship, it doesn't matter the age. Uh, it, it can be people over 80. It can be um, school kids that are 11 years old. They all know the Titanic. Um, so Actually, I would I would ask um, because I, I know uh, Todd, you you've been um, a big fan, uh, so you 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 used to be um, a, a, a fan of Titanic, and um, my question regarding the importance of this ship is um, um, how how important was the Titanic um, uh, for you to to become interested. In, in ocean liners in general or ships in general? Well, I, I, for me, like a lot of people, it was like this gateway drug kind of, you know, situation where I was a kid, I was watching TV and it was the anniversary of the disaster and they showed footage probably from a night to remember. And, you know, I was little and I just, it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen to me. You know, the image of the ship lit up and, and, uh, and the, 
the, the, you know, the disaster part is, is so, it, it's like a legend that nobody could, even if the best fiction writer couldn't write a story like that, the drama, the rockets going off and, and, and you know, everything's so still and perfect, like a stage set. Uh, it, it, it's very enthralling and it's, you know, it, you get carried away with it and then you just want to know more and more and more. And, and uh, you get wrapped up in this whole universe and it's just, concentrated on this one ship this one vessel and she was of course part of a, a long story she was like a, a, a people have said this you know a step on the ladder then there would have been the other ships and then going up and up and up um so you get captivated by the legend and you get enthralled and you think oh the most beautiful at that very moment she was the greatest ship on earth but then in in fact you know in the blink of an eye she would have been you know last year's news uh, you know, when the Hamburg America came out with the Imperator, that was like mega luxury. It just put the Titanic in the cloud, you know, away. It's far much, you know, more opulent. You know, of course, you know, the swimming pool is the biggest, you know, thing you can compare them on. And uh, the, the Germans just went over the top with everything. So, and it, to the detriment of the Imperator's stability, as, as a lot of people know. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> uh, uh, that's that's uh, uh, that's also a fact. It's also a very very interesting ship. But um, so I, I like I like the the, the wars you use thought. So like the, this middle child uh, aspect of the ship, but but also this gateway drug. Um, uh, Stephen, how, how was it for you? Because I mean, you you you, uh, I know you also became a naval naval architect uh, because it's a, it's a passion you have since you were a child. Um, how important was the Titanic and the, all the, the 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 mythology surrounding the ship uh, uh, for you to to decide at a point uh, to to get interested in shipping? Well, of course, the moment the Titanic sank, she was the largest passenger ship in the world for for that <laughs> moment in time. So, for her to sink on a maiden voyage in the manner that she did. And, and she was the first really disaster that was spread around the world by telegraph. <laughs> um, so other disasters that had happened beforehand, um, communications were such that it, it took weeks for news to go around the world. But the Titanic was the first major disaster event that only took a few days to go around the world because of wireless and, and the telegraph system. So it, it, it's that sort of first event. But she certainly does have that um, mystique. And of course, there, there are so many small things that have added up to create the disaster. Like she could remain afloat with five of her forward compartments flooded. And the sixth compartment was flooded just within a few centimeters. But that was enough to admit water into the hull for just a bit too long and, and she couldn't stay afloat. There are, of course, lo lots of discussion about the, the number of lifeboats, and lifeboat places but they were still launching lifeboats as the ship sank beneath them. So perhaps if there had been more boats, would they have been able to have got those boats away in, in time? The other thing that I think we, we have to say here is that Titanic sailed only half full on that maiden voyage. Mm. So had she been with a full complement of passengers, the disaster would have been even more, um, you know, bad. But the, for me as a naval architect, the biggest legacy of the Titanic is that she drove countries to come together to form an international set of standards and rules, which there hadn't been before. And, and the big problem with the rules saying the ship only needed four bulkheads and white star and Harlan and Wolf deciding to fit 15 of that. That the problem was that those rules and regulations had been devised 15, 20 years previously and passenger ships had grown in size so quickly 
that the rules were outdated and they couldn't update them quickly enough. So originally after the Titanic disaster, there was this move to create an international set of rules called safety of life at sea. And that was all set to take place in 1914, but sadly the First World War interrupted that. And it wasn't until 1929 that the first SOLAS was um, written down and enforced. And then it was updated in 1948, 1960, and then 1974. And since then, because it's too much work to update the whole set of rules, they've just updated separate chapters of it. And so there have been various amendments. But certainly Titanic brought in a lot of regulations, life-saving, pumping, radio telegraphy, the ice patrol, <clears throat> many, many things. So the safety that we have today on passenger ships, we can trace back all the way back to the sinking of the Titanic. So although it was a terrible event, and a lot of people sadly lost their lives, the legacy of it has been very, very positive. Yeah. All right. That's uh, actually, that's, uh, uh, that's a point. Uh, that's, it's interesting <coughs> enough because uh, um, I, I'm under the impression it doesn't get stressed enough when, when people speak about the Titanic and how how, how uh, magnificent the ship was and so on, uh, uh, and, and how important it is. I think that this uh, SOLAS regulations, this international set of rules, um, really are the greatest legacy uh, of the Titanic. Actually, the, we, we have um, the, the Britannic, you, you spoke about it before, um, uh, Stephen, um, the, the younger sister of the Titanic uh, that sunk uh, um, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, in the Aegean, I think, if I remember Aegean, well. Aegean, yes. Yeah. Um, the ship didn't hit an iceberg, you don't have those in the, the Aegean, but they hit a sea mine uh, left by a, um, a German submarine. And um, there, there was human error involved in this situation of the ship. Uh, bullheads were open and um, uh, the... the um, uh, both eyes of the ship were partially open because they were ventilating the, the rooms for the patients aboard the, the hospital ship. Um, and nevertheless, the ship sank quite fast too, uh, but nevertheless, there was only 70 deaths and they, they died because they, so at the end they died because they didn't follow the captain's orders. They left, um, uh, uh, um, they left uh, uh, lifeboats to the water too fast. Um, so as, as far as I know, actually this, this um, the, there, was, there were lessons learned from the, the tragedy of the, the Titanic and those lessons were applied to the construction of the Britannic. Am I yes, the, the Britannic was built with a double hull. So they, they built another skin inside the, the ship. And the idea was that if, the outside hull was breached, but this double hull would um, remain watertight and so the ship could, could stay afloat. And they also retrofitted the Olympic with um, a similar double hull. But the, the big problem with the um, Britannic, very much like the Lusitania, was that the explosion of the mine, in Britannic's case and torpedo in the Lusitania's case, is that it's largely thought that um, the coal that was used to um, use in the boilers to raise steam, that there was a lot of coal dust in the bunkers and the, the explosion disturbed the coal dust and created like a, a cloud of coal. And in that circumstances, with an explosion, a small explosion, the coal dust will ignite and create a very big explosion and they consider that that destroyed some of the watertight integrity of the ship as well. And that, that's why, why she sank so quickly. All right. So, so but, but actually, uh, um, so we can say that, um, uh, that they were quite uh, uh, safe ships. 
I mean, uh, the, the, the Britannic, there was, uh, well, it's a little bit cruel to say for, for people that did lose their lives, but there was almost no casualties uh, uh, on the Britannic. Um, and um, and there could have even been known if they have just waited to let the the uh, the lifeboats uh, until the the uh, propeller stopped turning, because that was uh, the problem. Um, but it's it's quite interesting because so you 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 actually you actually say the Titanic wasn't especially uh, a unsafe ship. No, not at all. No, uh, and. If, if you know when you think the the Titanic was, was something like 800 <laughs> just over 800 feet long and the damage when she bumped along the side of the iceberg because she didn't hit it head on she actually scraped along the side and when you you imagine you you've got something that weighs 50,000 tons in weight traveling around 23 miles per hour there's a tremendous amount of energy in that. You think of a car crashing into a wall or something, but you, you've got this 50,000 tons moving at 23 miles an hour. Nothing is going to stop that very, very quickly. Yeah. And so when she approaches the iceberg, she doesn't hit it head on. She scrapes along the side. So she's going to continue to scrape along the side and something's got to give. The ice is like um, solid water, um, really, really hard, like diamond. And so it was the hull that split open for nearly one third of the length of the ship. Right. And there's almost no ship except warships that would stay afloat even today with one third of the ship damaged. That and as I say, she was just unlucky because the, the total area of the damage, unbelievably, was something like 30 feet, less than three meters, hmm. the total area of the damage. But it was because it was spread over 85 meters, 300 feet, just a, a small opening in, in various parts that it opened up one more compartment than she could cope with. But no, for the time, the Titanic was certainly as safe as any other ship. Um, she wouldn't comply with, with a lot of things we do today, especially with fire protection and things like that. But um, the, the basic safety of the ship was no different from any other. And the way she was operated as well. Some people say, oh, Captain Smith... Um, was very wrong because he was racing to get to New York. He was after a record. Well, the plain truth was the Titanic couldn't in any form capture the records from Lusitania and Mauritania. She just didn't have the, the power to do it. But she was traveling around 22 knots and um, that they were unlucky and that, that she struck the iceberg. All right. So so you, you, you would go as far as to say that the, the, this, um, uh, this idea that the, um, that, uh, uh, the officers in the Titanic, on the Titanic uh, did grave mistakes, uh, is that, is that a, a myth or, or is, there, um, uh, um, is there some base? Well, we, we wouldn't do it today. Mm -hmm. uh, it wouldn't, but you know, we've got mitigating things today. We've got radar and, and there are ice patrols so we know where the ice is a lot clearer than they did in Titanic's day. But certainly the, what they did on Titanic was no different to the um, other ships. And um, yeah, um, she was very safe and, um, and everything else. Mm -hmm. If I may just stop there, I've just been buzzed by our friend. Oh, are we having? Uh, are we having uh, uh, um, um, our uh, fourth uh, 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 colleague joining in? Or I said, are you able to join us? And he says, I am. So um, I'm. I'll say if you wait a second. I I'm uh, uh, checking if I can 
but I I haven't got him uh, on the list. Uh, why? No, I'm I'm uh, I'm checking the the partition. Okay, I, I I've said to him, click on the link in your email. Okay. Because this this would be uh, another uh, another interesting. Um, no, absolutely, point. absolutely. Actually, I, I... very very much very much joining with a with a subject which is hard. It's the point of yeah, the, that's right. Yeah. The, yeah, absolutely. And and we also must firing. ask him about the rudder. And... Oh yeah, and um, uh, uh, but but actually, it's, it's uh, so it's it's quite it's quite interesting because uh, there is um, so, so far the answers you you. Or the, the, what what you've both been saying um, uh, is kind of like uh, in the middle. So so neither the, the greatest ship in history nor a bad ship at all. No, I don't think so. So and I, I and I also think you know that people say that the way she was built, she was built with inferior steel and the thing. That, that's a complete myth. All Absolute right. Nonsense. <laughs> I don't know if you agree with that, Todd. But, uh, no, I, I agree definitely very much. I, I think there's a lot of people out there who latch on to ideas and, and make things appear, sensationalise things in order to sell books and things like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very <But> true. Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> It's also a way for people like enthusiasts to, you know, take part in the story, which is if I ever get around to talking about that, uh, the whole building up of the cult of the Titanic and the goal of most people is to be part of the story. And if you come through with some amazing angle of like explaining everything, you know, or, or something nobody thought about, it's, it's, a, it's a way to like become part of the story. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. That's uh, that's a, a, a very good point. There, there is even well, I, I don't really think we should be discussing those, but that there is quite a large amount of, of conspiracy theories uh, uh, <laughs> regarding the Titanic, and and uh, uh, some some it goes from absolutely absurd to 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 uh, out straight uh, um, uh, insulting. Um, um, but well, I, I think the worst one is when they say it wasn't the Titanic that sank, but it was the Olympic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that there's a complete deck on the Olympic that, that's um, an enclosed promenade that on the Titanic is full of cabins. Hmm. So there's no way that you could swap the two ships around. And, you know, um, it, it's a, it, there were completely different ships in a lot of respect. Hmm. What I find fascinating, though, I, I'm, I'm building um, a large model of the Titanic at the moment. Mm -hmm. And the Olympic, the center propeller, because they, the ships had three propellers, but the center propeller on the Olympic is a four-bladed propeller. And it was assumed that the Titanic would also have a four-bladed propeller. But there's a huge lot of doubt whether or not they were actually experimenting with a three-bladed propeller on the Titanic. And I just find it amazing that there are no records available um, or pictures where they can prove or disprove that at the moment. It's sort of lost in time. That's that's also uh, that's also an interesting point. You, you um, uh, today everything oh. Uh, uh, wait a second. We we are going to. We have a a, a, a new guest joining. Hey, okay. So uh, I'm just adding into the conversation. Okay. And and uh, this uh, um, is going to happen in a second. So good evening, uh, Aureliano. Uh, welcome. To the to the chat. I'm really sorry. the The internet has been very bad today. I've been trying until now, so I apologize. Uh, you don't need to apologize. We can understand that perfectly. Uh, I'm just going to to introduce you to to the people watching the video. Um, this is actually um, this is um, Arelli, Arliano uh, Mazzella. 
Is that, is that correctly pronounced? Perfect. Uh, Aureliano Mazzella. Aureliano Mazzella is actually so we 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 have now right now here uh, uh, the a man who knows who knows how to build an ocean liner, Stephen Payne. We have a, an expert and collector on ocean liners. That's Todd right there, and now we have Aureliano who um, actually now knows how to stand at the helm of an ocean liner. Then. Um, Aureliano is the deputy captain uh, of the Queen Mary too. We spoke about the ship. Uh, shortly. Correct. And and this is also very nice because Aureliano is joining us actually from the Queen Mary too. And aboard a ship, uh, internet connection is not always very good. So uh, so that's why you are uh, most welcome to be here. And uh, there is actually no problem at all that you you couldn't join before. But my um, pleasure. <clears throat> so. Great, great that you are here. We were already speaking with with um, uh, Stephen and Todd uh, about um, about the the Titanic and and wondering is that is that the greatest ship ever or was it a bad ship? And um, actually, the, the conclusions until now is uh, what, what what Stephen and, and Todd have been saying um, is that it was neither of those two things. Um, and actually, um, uh, Stephen just uh, um, just uh, uh, was speaking about uh, how the uh, how the the, the officers uh, reacted on the Titanic and how they were working. And um, it would be very interesting to to have uh, um, your perspective uh, uh, as an as an officer aboard an ocean liner about. Um, yep. What has changed? Uh, I guess many things, but what has changed since Titanic sailed and and um, and such? So, yeah, uh, no, 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 it's a, a very well placed oh. question. I, I think that first of all, uh, oh, she. when I when I was when I was asked to <laughs> join, I had to do my own work, um, but it was very was very interesting to to actually look into how things are and how they used to be. So uh, first of all is that it is very easy for us to say there are a lot of good practice now in place, but that's because of what happened through the years of the many learning um, experiences. So definitely the officers that we have now currently on cargo ship or passenger ships, first of all, they have a much more structured uh, baseline of training to rely on, which is obviously framed by the STCW. So there is a minimum standard. On top of that, many companies, uh, for example, tanker companies will send their officers in their specific courses that they want their crew to be more proficient with. Um, passenger ship obviously will, will probably invest more in um, ship handling or familiarization with pod propulsion, uh, emergency response. So we have all sorts of courses to prepare officers even before joining the a passenger ship for the first time uh, on what to expect if anything goes wrong and, on, and also what to expect on how the other officer will behave. So when they join the team, they basically all play from the same team sheet. They're all on the same page. Um, so the, the short answer is a lot has changed. Another thing that uh, came up to my mind, uh, Damien, is that uh, they were only 1912 and only 30 or 40 years prior, even less, the majority of the vessel, there were other paddle steamers or sailing ships. So many of the senior officers may have done their training on those ships. So their mental model was based on what to do how to behave and what are the best practices on a sailing ship or a paddle steamer with slower speed, smaller dimension, and maybe even uh, a lot more easier to manage because mainly on a passenger ship, uh, sorry, on a, on a sailing vessel, on a sailing even big, everything is in front of you. The bridge sits behind the whole ship. You can see the whole ship you can kind of manage everything in, in a line of sight. On a passenger ship, 
that is the Titanic behind you or the Green Mary Do. Everything sits behind you. And so anything that happened, we, we left to rely on a preset chain of communication and organization, which in many companies called ERO, or Emergency Response Organization. Since the sh ships are so big, there has to be a protocol in order to find out where the accident happened and get the communication established, whether on a smaller ship, like where perhaps most of the crew has started, everything was more or less inside. Even the old bilge pumps, they used to be on deck until not many years prior to that. Whether on a ship like a Titanic, everything was completely designed in a different way, maybe closer to what is now um, more than a hundred years later than how it was 20, 30 years before that accident. So again, I confirm that from what I can see professionally, a lot changed very quickly in those years that the preparation, the training of the officer couldn't keep up probably. That's very, that's, that, that's actually, uh, it's the first time I, I hear this, this, um, uh, this point. Um, and, and that's actually very interesting. There is, um, there is, um, um, uh, uh, the thing came to my mind, it was in the, um, uh, uh, another tragedy, well, with less uh, lives lost at sea, um, uh, took place in the 50s, um, and just the other way around, it was the sinking of the Pamir. Uh, Pamir was mm -hmm. one of these uh, um, um, uh, great wind, uh, windyamers, this is great sailing ships that used to cross uh, um, um, Cape Horn. Um, so the clipper. It is, yes, it was. Yeah. It, they, they, it was the last, the last one that was still active in the merchant navy. They were still using it as a cargo ship in the fifties, and uh, in the near of the Azores, uh, uh, a storm hit, and the, the ship was lost, and the whole crew was lost. I think that the cargo shifted, didn't it? Yes, that's the that's one of the well that, that's actually the, the the main theory that's probably what happened the, the the sea was too strong and the cargo shifted it was uh, barley I think they were carrying yeah, yeah grain um, yeah and 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 the, the the thing is one of the the problems that ship had and and that great sailor ships in that time had is that um there was mm -hmm. no nobody is was being trained to to um to, to sail on a sailing ship back then in the merchant navy. So they, they mm -hmm. had a problem to get uh, to get uh, officers and a crew that knew what to do aboard the ship. And um, I've read in, in several places that that was one of the reasons why this tragedy happened, that the, uh, the, the crew was not so well, as well prepared. Uh, as uh, she should have been, have been because nobody was teaching how to sail on a sailing ship in the in the 1950s. So um, it's it's very interesting because um, Orlena was just like like argue, arguing, making the same argument, but the other way around. Oh. That uh, uh, um, yeah. the ocean liner like the Titanic was actually a very uh, very high tech uh, new ship uh, back in the day. Yes. This, which is actually true. So it was um, very, very, mu very much, yes. But it, it, it's like um, when you go onto a ship like the Queen Mary, um, if, if you come from a conventional ship using shafts, you, you need the training beforehand to be able to, to manage the pods, don't you? Hmm. Definitely. Yeah. So, yeah I, think, I think the, the, the main point transported even to our days, Damien, is that now is a lot more structured that for any innovation, there is a series of trial and training. Uh, but even until 20 or 30 years ago, it wasn't as common. When I, when I started go to see 18 years ago, there were, all, there were captains coming to the end of their careers. I was beginning that they, they were still on uh, uh, steam turbine ships and that's how they started and progressed most of their career so you could see the two different approaches some of them they were very elastic and they they embraced uh, the, the the innovation up to what steven mentioned 
a pot de propulsion. Another one really struggled because they, they was, they, the kind of training was not quite there yet and the technology is shot ahead. So even, even then they, they, there was still a gap uh, which uh, in between ad, uh, advancement of technology and minimum standard of training, which has recently um, came up very quickly. And just to close this this uh, this paragraph, now the it's very good to see that our industry is coming very much in line with the um, aeronautic, aeronautical industry, um, where most of the bridges, for example, are standardized. Uh, very close to you, I think the Airbus factory. Um, doesn't matter if it's a 310, 320, or 380 Airbus, which is the biggest, the cockpit or the bridge is still very similar. So the officer or the governor doesn't have to think where, where is that function or that button. It's almost like second nature because it's already familiar. So we are coming up to the that level of familiarity, which in 1912 was far, far from being even considered. <laughs> yes. That's, that's a, a great point. We are we are slowly coming to to uh, to an end of our time today. Um, I would like to to um, uh, to ask another question to to Aureliano, who uh, uh, just because it's a question I already asked to to Stephen and Todd before, and is um, um, how, was the Titanic in any way uh, in your your childhood or youth? Um, the, well, the Titanic itself, the, the the myth surrounding the Titanic. Was it something? Um, was it something important for you, or did it? Um, did the ship inspire you in any way to to start a career at sea, like like you have? Um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go as far as saying that it got me to start, but definitely it's it's, it's something that any uh, sailor or, or deck officer that they would like to be gold as such, will we'll know something about to some extent. Um, I'm a little bit biased because I have to say that I, I'm a lot more into um, our own ships like the Rex, uh, which mm -hmm. <laughs> the engine, the, 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 the gobby of the engines are even in Rome. So it's very easy for me to access that, but no. So the answer to your question is definitely to an extent, yes, because even if it wasn't the fastest in those days, it was the equivalent of a Concorde or a ship uh, in terms of size, luxury, and like you said, technology. Uh, it is quite fascinating to see that in 1912, they already had remotely controlled watertight doors. So yes. wh when, when, when the question comes and say, was the ship safe? Well, until 10, 20 years before, they still had paddle steamer with sails. That vessel had watertight compartments uh, watertight doors. So I think even by all means, Stephen is far more qualified than me to say anything at all. But just from a first glance, the, 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 the architect of that ship and the whole team had really looked into the possibilities. Obviously, with the lack of previous experiences, they didn't have many models to work on. So from the terms of how fascinating was the ship, definitely it was a landmark and, and definitely any sailor will look up to it, and beside the tragedy, no one can deny that it was it was quite a, it was quite a thing in those days. And now, if we bring it back to a century ago, thank you very much. I I would like to to ask. I mean, uh, we will we will uh, hopefully well I, I, we will hopefully speak more about the the, uh, the Titanic and other subjects in the future. So. Um, but um, maybe, maybe I don't know. Todd, would you like to to um, uh, to do a final statement uh, regarding um, the myth of the Titanic and and uh, how it has evolved, and maybe why, or an explanation on your side on why for many people it is the greatest ship that ever was. Well, yeah, you know, as, I, as I sort of mentioned before, the story is, is like perfect. It's almost like biblical, like in the way it unfolds, like it's just enough to sink her. It was like the exact moment of her maiden voyage, the largest, most luxurious. And people love saying that. It's like whenever there's any kind of, you know, ship that comes to grief, they, they, they do tend to like, 
you know, play up its, um, you know, how amazing and magnificent it was. And in the Titanic's case, that was true, although, you know, soon to be uh, not so amazing uh, in the industry that at that time. So uh, I, I, th I think that it's just this romantic, emotional story that resonates so much with people that they become very attached to it. And, and this hyperbole of the story, you know, takes over from, it's, it's like, extra historical it becomes outside of the history of ocean liners okay thank you very much so uh, uh, i would like to, to thank you all three for joining us and i hope you you we can do this again uh, maybe about another ship it was a lot of fun for us so um maybe also the next time it won't be a green screen titanic model on the background uh, because i won't would be able to do this from the museum and not from home office. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think we'll, if my colleagues have anything to do with it, it will be the Rex because they're both fans of the Rex. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have. And then I, I will have to do some study. Some study. <laughs> the, the Rex was, I, I actually did a little bit of research, not, not that much uh, regarding the Rex. We, we do have a, a, a be a very small but incredibly good miniature. It's like the, the, the Rex on this size with the level of detail is just amazing there. The, there was this picture. I think I, I posted it last year on the, on the Instagram and Facebook pages of the museum. Um, also, also a fascinating story. I mean, there are, there are so many fascinating stories regarding ocean liners and with ships in general. Uh, but yeah, so I, I, I hope we will do this uh, again soon. And um, I would like just to say uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Aureliano. And, and thank all of you for watching and, and supporting the museum uh, online. Uh, and uh, well, till next time. Okay, Aho. thank you very much. Thank Ciao. you.